Space. Vision, dreams of passion. Basquiat's emergence in the art world in the 1980s is something that needs to be thought of in context relative to that historical era. The 1980s is a very interesting time in terms of American culture, hip hop culture, black culture. You think about the emergence of the king of pop, Michael Jackson, who in the 1980s with the Thriller and Bad albums becomes this sort of huge cultural phenomenon. We could talk about artists like Prince, Whitney Houston, we can talk about the transition of hip hop from a subculture to a culture over the course of uh, the 1980s. We could also talk about figures like Michael Jordan, Eddie Murphy. These are all figures who would emerge in the 1980s and become huge, become superstars in their walk of life. I think Basquiat's name needs to be included in that list. It's one thing to talk about his art, it's another thing to talk about his art and his overall cultural impact. I think you can uh, draw a straight line between bebop and hip hop. And I think that line that connects these two cultures is something that you see played out quite vividly in Basquiat's work, The Horn Players. The Horn Players, of course, refers to individuals such as John Burke's Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Yardbird Parker, of course, better known as Bird, Bird and Diz, for those who know. This connection between um, bebop and its emergence in the post-war period, 1940s, and of course, the emergence and spread of hip hop beginning in the late 1970s going forward. When we talk about Bird and Diz, when we talk about bebop, we're talking about a culture that becomes in many ways a lifestyle. Uh, bebop musicians are very interested in being taken seriously, taken seriously as artists. They don't want to be considered entertainers. They're rejecting this notion of uh, entertainment, um, while at the same time, uh, wanting to be regarded the way, say, classical musicians um, are regarded. So I think there's a connection there in terms of talking about bebop not wanting to be seen as entertainment but as art. In many ways, I think you find a reference to this in a Basquiat painting like Obnoxious Liberals, and particularly um, the statement, not for sale. There are stories, for instance, about early patrons of Basquiat's art wanting the paintings to match the colors of uh, their furniture, which of course is ridiculous. Um, and so this not for sale declaration um, is in many ways, I think, another attempt at wanting to be regarded as, as an artist. Basquiat's place in the art world of the 1980s parallels um, what's going on with Bird and Diz and Bebop uh, in the 1940s and 50s. Get funky, get Basquiat's emergence in the 1980s is consistent with the emergence and spread of hip hop culture. And there are numerous examples we could point to to demonstrate this, one being uh, Basquiat's appearance in the uh, Blondie video Rapture. He, of course, appears as a DJ. Um, his artwork on the cover of the Beat Bop album, I mean, an album that uh, in its work sounds very much like, say, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, particularly referring to songs like The Message and White Lines, which is what you can hear um, when listening to the Beat Bop album, but the cover, which Basquiat does himself, sort of extends this. And also, of course, you have the ubiquity of what we call one of the four elements. Hip hop was known for the four elements, emceeing, DJing, breakdancing, and graffiti. So, of course, the graffiti is especially prominent. Taggers would influence Basquiat. He would have his own version of this. I think you see references to this in films like Wild Style and Style Wars, early examples of independent films documenting um, the hip hop movement and particularly 
um, the emphasis uh, on graffiti. So in this piece, horn players, you get this connection played out between bebop and hip hop. You see the drawing of this straight line from one cultural era to the next, and Basquiat really is the connection um, between these two worlds. One of the uh, recurrent images you find in uh, a number of Basquiat paintings is the image of the crown. The crown is uh, quite ubiquitous with strings too, for instance, is but one example. We see the crown quite often. I think the crown is significant in a number of ways. Connecting bebop and hip hop, one could reference, for instance, individuals like Duke Ellington and Count Basie. Individuals from another era who uh, took these names uh, indicating royalty. And of course, the crown uh, refers to king. King, of course, being uh, a moniker that is uh, uh, ubiquitous in hip hop and has been for quite some time. So, for instance, you can think about Run DMC uh, calling themselves the king of rock, which I think is really interesting because they didn't say the king of rap. Uh, rock, of course, being derivative itself of black music, and so there's this effort um, uh, to claim the culture, the king of rock. Or, for instance, you could think about the great Biggie Smalls, who often referred to himself as the black Frank White, a reference that speaks specifically to the underground Abel Ferrar film, The King of New York, and this notion the king, the king of New York, is something that um, has long applied to rappers in the city uh, most associated with hip hop's origin. So the ubiquity of the crown in both uh, jazz culture and hip hop culture, I think, is quite interesting. One of the other things I think we can think about, of course, is the individual uh, otherwise known as Muhammad Ali. Uh, Basquiat himself, of course, does uh, numerous paintings referencing Muhammad Ali by his government name, Cassius Clay, before he became Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali, of course, is famous for declaring himself the king of the world, the greatest of all times. And this assertion of sort of positive self-affirmation was quite important in the 1960s when Ali himself emerged on the scene and I think also is referenced uh, across a series of Basquiat paintings. We can go back to what I call the lineage, starting with Jack Johnson, the great Jack Johnson, um, having to deal with this notion of the great white hope and prevailing. We can talk about the cultural influence of a boxer like Sugar Ray Robinson, which connects us to another piece uh, by Basquiat when he refers to one of Sugar Ray Robinson's models, Henry Armstrong in the Wicker piece. Um, and of course, we could also talk about how this notion of royalty factors into a piece, um, again, referencing Charlie Parker, Charles I. Most young kings get their heads cut off, which if you think about it is a remix of the sort of classic Shakespeare quote, uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. But the difference is most young kings relative to say hip hop um, experience a much different fate. They get their heads cut off. There's something about this notion of being the king and society and the way in which um, this statement on the Charles I piece um, speaks to um, the way in which the individual in this space um, has to deal with haters, as it were, um, influences coming from all throughout society with the desire um, to cut off one's head, um, the cutting off of one's head, I think could be read multiple ways. In one sense, if you go back into jazz culture, um, the notion of a cutting session when musicians competed against each other, um, uh, the loser was said to have had his head cut. But I think in another way, Basquiat is speaking to how difficult it is for individuals identified through the moniker of the king, the crown, of course, referencing graffiti as well, tigers anointing themselves the king. What Basquiat is referencing is the difficulty of being royalty in such a problematic society as the one he encountered. Now, 
There's often a great deal of text on Basquiat paintings, words. And one of the things that we notice about the use of these words in the paintings is the consistent crossing out of words. Um, very common um, practice um, of Basquiat that we can see across a number of different paintings. Crossing out words. Basquiat talked about um, crossing out words as a way of getting people to pay more attention to them. People are curious about what it is that has been crossed out. And I've often thought of this uh, similar to, say, in jazz and bebop. Musicians were often deconstructing, what I like to call deconstructing the American songbook standards, right? These standard songs that the bebop musicians in their own way were playing, but playing in such a way so that these standards were often um, unrecognizable. They sounded nothing like they sounded before. It was necessary to deconstruct the American songbook so that you could rewrite the songbook from a perspective that emphasized the creativity emergent uh, from the bebop musicians, the post-bop musicians, and jazz itself. The key being this notion of improvisation. So I often like to point out, say, Julie Andrews um, and the sound of music. You listen to that, and then you listen to uh, My Favorite Things in particular, the song My Favorite Things from the Sound of Music, Julie Andrews' version, but then you listen to the John Coltrane version. These are clearly two very different songs. They share the same name, they're based on the same thing, but Coltrane's rendition of My Favorite Things is, of course, quite different than Julie Andrews. To me, this sort of improvisation, this crossing out, this deconstruction is what you see in the paintings and I think it directly ties it to jazz and jazz's influence. I think in terms of hip hop, for me the crossing out is akin to scratching. Hip hop's real interesting because it's this culture that emerges not from musicians playing instruments, as had been the tradition before. Increasingly during the 1970s, uh, public schools are losing funding around music and art programs. Hip hop is a music basically that draws on other music to create new music. It draws on pre-existing music, something old, it takes something old and finds a way to, quote, remix it and make something new. And so in that way, um, you take the album itself, the vinyl, the same way break dancers often use, you know, cardboard to break dance on. You talk about uh, DJs taking the vinyl, scratching the vinyl, but using that as a way of creating a new sound. These creative DJs, someone like Grandmaster Flash, um, credited with inventing the scratch, is able to take the record, do something you're not supposed to do, but in doing that, create a brand new sound. And so when I see Basquiat crossing out text, crossing out words, it for me has often implied something like scratching, particularly what these, this means in terms of, say, early hip hop. This concept of remix, I think, is something for me that comes through quite strongly when one looks at how often Basquiat would use this device of crossing out words in his paintings. One of the words that uh, some people have used to describe Basquiat's paintings is the word chaotic. There is for sure a lot going on in any given Basquiat painting. Words, slogans, references to historical figures, images, anatomy, all sorts of things. There is a great deal going on in any one piece at any given time. But I like to think about this as organized chaos. Not chaotic in the sense that it's all over the place, but organized chaos and that the paintings look like um, this very detailed landscape that 
is not unlike improvisation in jazz. Whereas the person who is performing is required as a serious jazz musician to draw on all sorts of references in order uh, to create their art. Um, there's a saying, a jazz musician never plays the same song twice. And that is because improvisation for a serious musician is the moment at which one is able to engage creativity to put their individual signature on a particular song. It's interesting because in classical music, the objective is often to play the original. There's little room for interpretation. Jazz, on the other hand, if you get on the bandstand as a jazz musician and simply play what someone else has played, you won't be on that bandstand very long. The objective is for you to make a unique original statement, which is what I think Basquiat is doing through um, these organized examples of chaos that exist in his work. I think if you were to bring that up to hip hop, this sense of organized chaos, I'm reminded of the way in which the public enemy records of the late 80s, early 90s would sound because of the work of their producers, the Bomb Squad. Brothers and sisters, I don't know what this world is coming to. Yes, the rhythm's the rebel. Without a pause, I'm lowering my level. The hard drama, will you never been them in? You want styling? You know it's time again. D, the enemy telling you to hear it. These really intricate um, soundscapes that could be described as chaotic, that were very involved, that were in many cases like jazz. It's the sort of thing, whereas the music doesn't necessarily go out to the listener, it expects that the listener, if the listener is going to understand, will come to the music. When listening to Public Enemy and the Bomb Squad, this was not music that you could listen to passively. In many ways, it's like jazz. You can't listen to this music passively. You have to engage the music. And I think in the same way, you can't view Basquiat's work passively. It requires that you actively engage with the material. As I say, you have to go to the material as opposed to expecting the material to come to you. In addition to the aesthetic value of Basquiat's work, one of the most salient features of his paintings is the way in which the paintings uh, engage in the practice of social critique, a sort of societal critique, drawing in the events of his time, but using the work to comment on those events and in the same way, um, there's something evergreen about the work in that the issues Basquiat's dealing with in his social critique are issues that I think in many ways are still very much with us. So one could refer, for instance, to his painting Defacement, which is specifically about the death of uh, graffiti artist Michael Stewart at the hands of the police, of course, a, very uh, long-standing and contemporary topic. Uh, black men dying uh, uh, based on their engagement with police all across the country. In New York in the 1980s, it was in this case tied to uh, a graffiti artist. Basquiat, of course, saying this could have been him, but that topic is, without saying, in a very obvious way, very much with us today. Um, defacement could have been about Eric Garner or any of a number of the names that unfortunately we have come to memorize in recent times. Trayvon Martin, uh, Jacob Blake, George Floyd. These are names that have become quite common for the wrong reasons in recent society in the same way someone like Michael Stewart is represented in the painting Defacement um, was very evident back in the 1980s. Some things, unfortunately, don't change. 
We could also point to another piece um, in which I think the title does a great deal of work related to this, and that is the irony of a Negro policeman. If you just think about what that means for a black police officer relative to issues of race and law enforcement as it pertains to racism in American society. In that way, one, for instance, is reminded of N.W.A.'s famous song, infamous song, Fuck the Police. Fuck the police coming straight from the underground. A young nigga got it back because I'm brown. And particularly Ice Cube's line, don't let it be a black and a white one. They'll slam you down to the street top. Black police showing out for the white cop. This, of course, is a image we also see played out in John Singleton's classic film, Boys in the Hood. So again, there is something historical, but at the same time contemporary about a piece like Irony of the Negro Policeman as well as Defacement. Take a black one to move me. I think another example we find is in a piece like Hollywood Africans, which really stands out. It kind of speaks to a moment when Basquiat um, came to LA in the 1980s, commenting on the film industry, Hollywood Africans saying African as opposed to African American before this uh, phrase African American had gotten so popular. Hollywood Africans, there's a foreignness to it, uh, speaking of Africans, but it's really a critique of Hollywood's long history of racism. So I think when you look at the piece Hollywood Africans, you also notice the word gangsterism, which is interesting because this is a few years before the emergence of gangster rap, but the notion of gangsterism the role of the gangster in American society, the modern gangster as I like to call it, from the Godfather in the early 70s going forward, the influence of gangster films on what would become gangster rap, and later something like The Sopranos or The Wire, um, Breaking Bad, this notion of gangsterism ultimately in the White House. One can talk about the role of the gangster in American culture the gangster in American society, but this is something, again, given to us by Hollywood that Basquiat himself comments on in this really uh, impressive piece, Hollywood Africa. Burn, Hollywood, burn. So when we think about what Basquiat has meant, his connection to bebop, his connection to hip hop, his connection to black culture, his uh, placement in the art world. This is the reason why only now are people really starting to come to terms with who he was, what he meant, what his work meant, and why we celebrate him and embrace him and regard him so highly in contemporary society because his work was of that moment, but of course it transcends that moment in making all these connections and speaking to what it means to be an American over a particularly compelling period of time. A child is born.